we're basically using the EDSAC as a classic example of a very early von Neumann computer. <clears throat> and to the great credit of Cambridge, I mean, they did get it working by, I think it was April, May 1949, something like that. And uh, it went on to great glory afterwards. And calculations on there from many Cambridge scientists. I mean, it's no exaggeration to say Nobel Prizes were won because of the availability of EDSAC in all sorts of areas. We're going to take a look uh, and try and answer this, this question of how on earth do you get this wretched EDSAC to boot up? And with the help of Martin Campbell Kelly's emulator, we're able to, going to be able to show you something of that. Um, because what I want to do is to describe how the initial boot programs, first stab at it was called Initial Orders 1, second stab was called Initial Orders 2, written by a really bright guy who was the PhD student of Maurice Wilkes, who led of the EDSAC team, of course. That chap's name was David Wheeler, a really nice chap. I did know him only slightly, but he was fearfully bright and always good for a chat about low-level issues like this, about how did you get this wretched thing to work. Given that, I suspect, inherited on EDSAC, but feeding back into early things again, like Tommy Flowers' Colossus. Um, how do you get a bit pattern in here to tell it to do what to do? Because if you want to get the bit pattern in, the electronics, the logic and everything inside it will execute it correctly. That will have been checked out, but how do you get the wretched things in? And the answer, certainly on the Colossus machine, was you used a set of what were called uniselectors to set up the ones and zeros. And by having enough uniselectors, plus usually a sort of load lever to load it into the current location in memory. Then you had to have an automated way inside the hardware of stepping onto the next word to be loaded. Um, people like me didn't use uniselectors, but learnt this up when you booted up an early PDP-11. Even as late as the 60s and 70s, it wasn't uniselectors, it was hand keys on front of the panel. I think we've shown those once or twice. Same thing. Up for a one, down for a zero, boom, 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 load. Another pattern, load. Another pattern, load. It's bad enough loading up a little boot program. It's unthinkable to load in an entire multi-kilobyte program that way. But on the basis of hand switches and uniselectors in this case, yes, these wonderful initial orders 2 and initial orders 1 were loaded in from uniselectors. Once you've downloaded Martin's emulator, it comes with a tutorial guide. And it makes it very clear in there <coughs> that on the actual EDSAC, when you wanted to load initial orders, you just press a button. John is working here on um, the uniselector unit. I talked about the boot ROM or the initial instructions. Those are coded by how he's wired up these uniselectors. When the operator presses the start button, a rotor spins in here and as it passes each set of contacts, that gets injected into the memory to download the program. To give you some idea, the initial orders, I think, were about 42 words, not 42K, not 42 meg, like it might be on a modern BIOS, 42 words, because memory was fantastically precious. What was a word then? Is that 16 bits? A word bits? is, well, actually it was 18 bits in EDSAC, but basically, yeah. Uh, an 18-bit word could be loaded in. Um, and you could load the whole thing in by hand, but you wouldn't want to. So here's the challenge then. There's all this memory here in Mercury available. What you want is something sitting down at the bottom of memory to help you get bit patterns in off paper tape. OK, so that will be your boot program. Now that's the kind of thing sitting in low memory, which nowadays is the BIOS, and it's a heck of a sight more complicated than Initial Orders 1. So what David Wheeler did for Initial Orders 1 said, just to get us started, early 1949, I will write a set of Initial Orders that sits there all the time, and other people's tapes that come along I want to say two things to them. First of all, please do not trample all over my initial orders that have been preloaded. Don't go into very low memory addresses like zero and start trying to overwrite it. Kill the program stone dead. But 
starting from, I think he finished at 42 with his initial orders, but to allow for future expansion, I think the recommendation was start off at location 64 in memory. 64 and above, you put your program there. I will now help you load it, because when you uh, put your paper tape in, it will be my initial orders one that is asking to read your tape character by character, okay? And initially, in initial orders one, he said, I will do the following. If you type A, I know that A is a certain bit pattern meaning add, and I will put that in the correct field of the correct word for you. You may then want to write an explicit decimal number to be added, like 10. To save your brain, I will translate your decimal numbers in your instructions into binary. So there's two things I'm doing for you, is I'm translating the opcode, I'm translating obviously decimal numbers into binary, and I'm keeping track of where I'm loading them for you into memory. I will start, if you say start at 64, I'll start at 64, and I'll put them in successively one after the other. So far, it sounds to me like he's doing the job of a modern CPU with registers and an interpreter to interpret the code. Yeah, it's like a very elementary assembler, but whereas with assembly, it's a two-pass process, you run the assembler and then you've got your binary. Here, you're using assembly codes to make your own binary on the fly. Is this the great-grandfather of the operating system, then? Oh, yeah. The great, great, great grandfather of the operating system. First of all, we are starting with a loader because that's all this is. It loads into memory, but it's very crude. Initial orders one, right? What drove people mad about it was that unfortunately, you had to be in control of your addresses because if your program said jump to location 70, you start at 64, fine. But what happens if you want to intervene a few more orders, a few more instructions between 64 and 70? You've got to alter all the addresses in your program because what was at 70 where you wanted to go to is now at 76. So you've got to go and say, don't jump to 70, jump to 76. So although it was a loader, it couldn't do anything much about being at all adaptive or helping you to relocate, as it was called. So this was realised very quickly, that any alteration to your programme <coughs> involved changing all your addresses on the tape. So, initial orders two, David Wheeler became celebrated throughout the computer science world for this. He only in his life ever published 11 papers, did David, but he was still an FRS. That's how much he was rated. I remember meeting Don Knuth once saying, uh, you know, who have you met recently? What have you been doing? I said, oh, I saw David, not DJ Wheeler, he said, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, initial orders too. I mean, yes, David was really celebrated for this. It seems obvious now, but it certainly was not obvious at the time. Everybody, wow, your initial orders too is going to help us be able to alter the program and just feed the tape in again without changing all of the addresses. All we have to do is to change the load point at the top, say, or something like that. Maybe we don't want to put it at 64, we want to put it somewhere else. But what David Wheeler said was, so long as you throughout your orders, indicate and flag up to me the addresses that will need changing. I will keep track of them and I will alter them for you. Are these like variables then, effectively? Yeah, they basically, it was, it was doing what modern assemblers can do anyway, but very early on saying, no matter where you choose to place this in memory, you might want to put it at 128 or 256 or anywhere. Just tell me. And I will load it there and I will fix up all the addresses. You can just sort of say like 012 if you like, but I will add on 64 to them or 128 added on to them or whatever you want. All you must do is flag up to me the addresses that need to be altered in a special way that my initial orders understand. And it just revolutionized the use of EDSAC because <clears throat> what uh, of course, every computer scientist wants to do, and admittedly this was not done in 1949, it was done recently, is get your computer to say hello world. 
Well, there's a contributed program here that for the sake of brevity just gets it to say hi. And perhaps we ought to run hi first and then say how the heck does initial orders to enable this to be loaded in and to work correctly. So here we go then. This is the program that will first of all load when I say start. Start loads the program that is showing in your window on the left. It is loaded in the high program. However, with my <laughs> fading memory of EDSAC codes, I can see that the third instruction there, ZF, means stop. That was a very common trick to use as an EDSAC program, is make it stop in its execution early on, because then you can check in your peep, your peephole into the tanks. Does it look plausible? Does all of this stuff here look like a binary interpretation of all your elementary assembler opcodes? And people would know what to see. Oh, they know what to see. Oh, yes, you can look in there and say, oh, you know, that looks like an ad instruction to me. Yes. So there we are. Now that's stopped here, but what you can now do is to single shot it. Those of you again in Assembler will know you often have a single shot capability for debugging. This is like a step through, is it? Yeah, just a step through. With a bit of luck, single EP. Ah, I've got a cursor now. If I single EP again, look, it's printed the letter H. Single shot again. Hi. So I think one of the exercises in Martin's instructions, I encourage you all to do it, is to get it to actually say hello world. Just make it a bit longer. But here, when we look at the program, we can see an awful lot of what is actually happening here. It's saying stop, but then it goes on to actually outputting the message. How does it do it? It uses an O, output instruction. And that is part of the EDSAC opcode. It basically means punch this to tape which is the way it would have come out initially. With this at symbol, that was one of the signals to David Wheeler's initial orders. This is a relative address, not an absolute one. And I want you to adjust it for me. And because right at top, we've said T64K, for assembler programmers, that's like saying org origin equals 64 in many assemblers. But here it's starting point is 64. But look at this, O5 at symbol means output the thing that is five locations beyond where I currently am. The at says you've got to add on the baseline now to the 569. So down here then, what it does first of all is it outputs star F. That is the code that says turn into letter shift. Now, if you go back and watch my previous five-hole paper tape program, you'll find that whether it's Bordeaux code or EDSAC code, you have to make sure. If you want to print out letters, be doubly sure you are in letter shift, not in figure shift, uh, and vice versa. Otherwise, it will all look like junk. So here is the code in EDSAC that says, turn me into letter shift and make sure. Next instruction beyond here says, output the thing that is six beyond this location. And when you look there, right, it just says HF. So in other words, the letters H and I that are to be output are being picked up as data from instructions further down and are being output by using this memory relocation capability. So that's all you have to do is to put down Asterisk is shortcut in EDSAC for saying switch the letter shift, print the letter H, print the letter I, but it's all done very carefully by adjusting these addresses here to actually be 69, 70 and 71 in real life. And if you do that, you then say output the bit pattern that is in 69, it's a change to letter shift request. Do the one in 70, it's the letter H, because I've planted that there, and so on. So I hope that if you work through that very painfully, you can see that just that ability to use relative offsets, yeah, rather than absolute addresses, means that you, the amount of rewriting of your program, just because it gets bigger, can be greatly minimized. So what is Initial Orders 2? It's arguably the world's first elementary relocating loader. 
it is keeping your program well away from trampling on initial orders too but it's relying on initial orders too for translation for well it doesn't even need to translate opcodes into binary they are binary binary to decimal conversion and now relocation all done for you and all in much less than 64 words so that's why it's so celebrated this empty rack is one we haven't started very much work on yet this would have been the circuits to drive the paper tape reader and the teleprinter we do have a teleprinter and we do have a tape reader we've been driving those using a modern computer to test them out we've now got to design the interface circuits that fit here